You're here, I'm assuming, because you hear. You've come to hear the word. If you've come to hear me, you wasted your gas. But if we've come to hear what God has to say to us through his word, then that's really worthwhile. And that's our message today, talking about hearing the voice of God. What could be more precious and more important than hearing the voice of God? You know, uh, animals in nature, some of them have incredible voices. Uh, I think once or twice I was in Central or South America and I heard off in the distance this howl and someone told me it was a howler monkey. Howler monkey is one of the loudest land creatures. Its voice can be heard three miles away. If you're up close, it's very annoying. Have you ever heard howler monkeys? Yeah. Now elephants, it's not the, um, the honk. What do you call it when an elephant does their trumpet. trumpet? It's not the trumpet of the elephant that's so loud. Yeah, an elephant does this low rumble and when elephants rumble they can hear each other three miles away. No, six miles away. Howler monkey, three miles. Elephants, six miles away. But they don't hear with their ears. They hear with their feet. Because the rumbles are so low that somehow they transfer it seismically, I suppose. The loudest creature on earth is actually the song of the humpback whale. It's louder than a jet taking off. I in fact, um, it's a real problem for submarines. You got a pod of these whales and, and uh, during mating season the humpback males sing these long songs, very intricate songs, and they may be singing to a girlfriend that is 800 miles away. Yep, because the way that sound transfers in the water it can be heard at least 800 miles away. The voice of the humpback whale. But of all the different voices, God has given humans one of the most amazing and marvelous voices of all. The human voice can produce a range of several octaves in sound by using just two wedge-like projections of ligament or muscles called vocal cords. These sounds are amplified by built-in resonators in our heads called sinus cavities. And it's amazing that in order to sing a high C, a soprano's vocal cords must vibrate, meaning open and close, 1,200 times per second. Those of you who are sopranos who can do a high C. On the other hand, the men who can sing the low bass, it only requires 40 vibrations to reach that low C. Besides singing, our voices are capable of producing the most complex variations in speech. To control speech sounds, 72 sets of muscles work with split-second timing. In talking for one minute, the tongue and the jaw and the lips make at least 300 separate movements. At the same time, our vocal cords are vibrating and our respiratory muscles are forcing out just the right amount of air. And if that isn't complex enough, think of the many inflections in the voice capable of making and ranging up to nearly 500 audible pitches. One can vary the tone tremendously from the shout to a delicate whisper. Trained singers can hold a note for a long time, whereas an auctioneer can speak in a hyper-fast staccato. And yet uh, the Bible says, when Jesus came, no man ever spoke like this man. Human voice is really an incredible thing. You ever heard a computer program that's really done a good job of imitating human voice? You can always tell it's a computer. The w ones you think you think, oh, I've got a computer program, it sounds real. Probably what they've done is taped different words from a real human voice and then they link them together. But they've not really gotten, developed a computer program that can imitate the human voice. Some people have had remarkable voices. P.T. Barnum made a lot of money because there was this uh, Swedish singer named Jenny Lind and uh, she had a voice without artificial amplification that could be heard at great distances. Beautiful voice. One of the greatest male voices, I'm not talking about singers, that might be a Caruso, but one of the ma greatest male voices according to history was um, a preacher by the name of George Whitfield. 
George Whitfield was a friend of the Wesleys. Early in life, he had such an incredible voice, he went to the theater and he studied acting. And back then, they had no PA system, you would project from the stage. And he learned to take what was already an incredible voice and project from the stage. And uh, then he was converted and God put that to good use. Um, he was kicked out of the churches of England for preaching the conservative Puritan message. And so he began to do open air evangelism and preaching. Uh, preaching thousands of sermons over the course of his comparatively short life. Um, but he made history in that they say that probably more people could hear him without any artificial amplification than any other human. He was called the trumpet of the Lord because God gave them this incredible set of pipes. Benjamin Franklin even comments about George Whitfield in his autobiography. They became good friends. Whitfield worked for years to try to convert Franklin. And, uh, but they were good friends and Franklin printed many of his tracts. And Franklin being a scientist, he had heard that 25,000 people were listening. Can you imagine me trying to preach to 25,000 people? I need a PA system and we've got, you know, 500 here. 25,000 people. They say some of the ancient generals would address and harangue their armies before they went into battle and the whole army could hear them where there would be 20,000 people. They'd get up on a prominent spot and they'd speak. The Bible talks about Jesus talking to thousands from a boat or from the shore. And so what Franklin did is uh, Whitfield was preaching from the steps of the Philadelphia courthouse and he began to pace off distance. He was right up at the front and he paced off and he got nearly half a mile away and he could still hear him distinctly until it was interrupted by other background sounds on the street. And then Franklin being a, a scientist, he figured how many square feet each person takes up, how many people could theoretically hear him gathered in a semicircle. And he said 30,000 people could be gathered to hear him. One man, trumpet of the Lord. Now, not only was he a preacher with a loud voice, he was a powerful preacher. Franklin used to wonder why people would go to hear him preach because they said when they'd hear Whitfield preach, he would talk to them about their sins and it was so convicting and he was so um, uh, sometimes uh, powerful in proclaiming their sins. He thought, why would anyone go? But they came because they knew it was true. And he'd go through a town and all the saloons would close. Franklin comments, he says, after Whitfield went through community preaching, he says, well, before You'd hear cursing. He said you would hear people gathered on the street singing psalms. This one man had heard about Whitfield and he wanted to hear him preach, but he didn't want to give up his drinking. But he was very curious to see the man that had such a powerful voice. And a friend said, look, you better not listen to him because if you listen to him, you'll be converted. He says, no, I won't be converted. He said, I'm not about to give up drinking. He said, I don't even want to risk it. He says, I'm going to go plug my ears. Well, when he came to the place where Whitfield was about to start speaking, it was so crowded he couldn't get anywhere near. So like Zacchaeus, he found a tree and he climbed a tree. And up in the tree, he saw Whitfield was getting ready to go on this wooden platform and start preaching quite a ways in the distance. He thought, look, I don't want to get converted. So he wrapped his legs around the branch of the tree and he leaned against the trunk and he plugged his ears. And Whitfield commenced preaching. Well, back then they came to listen riding horses and so there were a lot of horse flies and horse flies bite. And this man saw a horse fly was buzzing around his face getting ready to land and uh, he, the horse fly landed on his nose. So he pulled his fingers out of his ears to swat the horse fly and right when he did that was at the very moment when George Whitfield said, he that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit saith. And he was so convicted, he figured he better keep listening, and he was ultimately converted. <laughs> now, most of us don't have problems talking. And a lot of us talk much more than we should. The Bible doesn't say, he who has a mouth, let him speak. It says, he that has ears, let him hear. In fact, seven times in Revelation, Jesus makes that statement word for word. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. He that has ears, let him hear. Um, you know, we've got the gift of tongues, and people talk about the gift of tongues, but a lot of us need the gift of hearing. 
because sometimes we struggle to hear what God is saying to us. Now, when I talk about hearing the voice of God, I am not talking about hearing God speak audibly. God has done that a few times in the history. Uh, we Paulo read about that in Deuteronomy where God spoke in giving the Ten Commandments. You can read in Deuteronomy 4.33, Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and live? Happened a few times in the Old Testament where God sp spoke audibly to people like Moses and Abraham and Jacob. There are others. Samuel. In the New Testament, it tells about from the baptism of Jesus, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And people heard that. John 12, verse 28, Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. There are the people who were standing by said they thought they heard thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice did not become, come because of me, but for your sake, that they might believe. And then Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain. And uh, after they saw the vision of Moses and Elijah, it says, then there was a voice from heaven. And God said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, here's my question for you. Why would God say, hear him, if it was not possible to hear him? Is it possible to hear the voice of God? Problem is, we're not very good listeners most of the time. Uh, I remember reading about President Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he would stand in these receiving lines. You know, he was president three terms, not all of uh, one of the terms. Uh, or was it almost four terms? I think he was voted into his fourth term and he, he died. And then, of course, Truman took over during World War II. But, um, he got so tired of receiving lines. The president went to all these different functions and dinners and you'd stand there and it was hard for him to stand. He was basically wheelchair bound but he could, you know, he had had polio when he was young. He could stand if he had secret service propping him up or he had something to lean against or he had a little st stool with a pad kind of that he would rest on and he'd stand and he'd smile in the receiving lines and people were always thinking, what will I say to the president? And they never were thinking, what's he going to say to me? He said, they don't listen to anything I say. Karen and I were in a line. We met uh, Vice President Pence a little while ago. And, and, uh, and I was thinking, what am I going to say? I wasn't thinking, what is he going to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, oh, by the way, I just said I appreciated the scriptures that he used. When he, he used several scriptures in his talk. But um, so Franklin said to one of his attendants one time, he says, they're not paying any attention to what I say. He says, watch this. People were going through line. He's smiling, shaking hands. He said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> and as the people came through, he said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And some of them said, keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> Others would say, that's wonderful, Mr. President. And then they'd start talking about whatever they wanted to share with the president. They would pay no attention to what he said. And uh, one dignitary for another country was listening carefully because he didn't speak that good English. And he said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. He said, well, Mr. President, I'm sure she had it coming to her. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about a, uh, a stewardess. You know, they give these talks before the plane takes off. And how many of you have been on a plane hundreds of times and you hear the flight attendant give their pre-flight talk and they say, you know, your exits are over here, right and left, and the lights go out. You've got the lights going down the aisle. Make sure your trays are up and you see. And, and everyone's just, you know, looking at their, I've got the earphones in and so the one flight attendant, she just said, and if we encounter turbulence and the cabin is depressurized, the oxygen mask will fall down from overhead. Take the mask, put it over your navel and breathe normally. <laughs> Nobody even noticed that she did that. People don't listen. Jeremiah 16, 12. Behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart so that no one listens to me. You can just hear the pain in the voice of God because he knows we're not listening. It's like a guy was telling his friend, you know, my wife is talking to herself. He said, oh, that's nothing. My wife's been talking to herself for years. She thinks I'm listening. <laughs> People talk and they don't listen. Most of the time when uh, someone's talking, 
most of our listening is waiting for them to stop so we can then share what we are wanting to say. We all like a good listener because they're so rare. Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 14, In them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and they should understand with their hearts. So what's the hearing that God wants from us? It's a hearing where we understand in our hearts so that I should heal them, heal them from our sin. So how do we know if we're hearing the voice of God? I thought I might even ask for a show of hands, but I changed my mind because it frightened me. I was going to ask if anyone here feels they have audibly heard the voice of God. You don't have to raise your hands. I meet people every now and then that think that they've heard the voice of God. And uh, uh, you've probably met people that they, they live in a very spiritual state and they say, God told me this today and God told me that. And usually they mean God spoke to their hearts or impressions or their spirit somehow. But some folks just are really walking in the spirit because I know people will say, yeah, God told me to buy this kind of toothpaste and I was driving and, I, and God said this is where he wanted me to park and God told me to buy this dress and you've you met people like that, right? You know what I'm talking? Yeah. That's okay. Some people are just very sensitive to the Spirit and I, I know when I was a baby Christian I was listening for the voice of God in everything because I realized God was everywhere so I was talking to him all the time and I was looking for indications and impressions and guidance on things that you know later you mature and you realize God just wants me to use good judgment I mean, you know, I was asking God just, should I buy the white corn chips or the yellow, Lord? <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> your perfect will. I want to be in your perfect will. And then, you know, God said, Which one do you like? I don't know. <laughs> but you know, so, so some people are always saying, God told me this and God told me that. And, and uh, so how do you know the voice of God? I used, used to wonder when God said to Abraham, Take your son, your only son. You'd want to know, how do I know that's your voice, God? Is that static I'm hearing? You'd think, well, that'd be the devil. It says, kill your son. But Abraham knew God's voice so well, he knew it was the voice of the Lord. And then he took Isaac, and when they went to the mountains, God told him, this is the mountain. He told him, leave your servants here. He told him to stop before he sacrificed his son. Abraham was very tuned in to God's voice. How could that be? Well, I think it's because he had heard the voice so many times he recognized it. I know when, uh, when I get a call from Karen, she doesn't need to say very much because, you know, every the human voice, all our voices are different. And the human voice is so distinct that all she needs to do is go, hi, I, go, I know who it is. That's all I need. Now, people are calling our house and Nathan sounds a little like me, though he sings better than I do. And they, they'll hear him answer the phone. They say, Doug? And he said, no, I'll go get him. But, you know, sometimes kids start sounding like their parents. But every voice is distinct. And now they've got the software. You know, they, you, you got an individual fingerprint. And then they got software. Some of you have got smartphones where you, it'll look at your iris now. How many of you heard of that? Yeah, it's got iris recognition. Because your iris on your eye is very different. And now they've got the software where your voice print is so unique that they have vaults and banks that it will only open for the manager. It records and it measures very fine nuances in the voice and it can identify them. I used to wonder, you know, I watch these nature programs. 50,000 emperor penguins, you know, all the females come back from feeding so, uh, and they got all these chicks and they go out there and they're all squawking and the females are actually looking for the husbands. Chicks had never seen it before. And there's this cacophony, this deafening cacophony. They're all, wah, 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 wah. and they all say, oh, there they are. And just how they hear it with all the background noise is amazing to me. You know, one reason we don't hear the Lord is because of background noise. There's so much going on. I know when I lived in the mountains, and quite literally, there was less distraction. I was thinking more about God. You can kind of hear the voice, that still, small voice coming through a little better. We're living in a culture now, in a world where uh, the devil 
has created so much background noise that it's seldom quiet. Okay, the television's gone and people walking around with the earphones and nearly get run over because they're, they're walking around with their earphones in their ears and, and uh, there's just constant noise. If it's not the radio, it's the TV, it's the traffic, but just this seems like we're surrounded by noise. And then there's a problem. When you get older, it's harder to hear when there's background noise. Can I get an amen? I can hear okay. If anyone here were to talk to me now, I'd probably hear you. But if you all start talking at the same time, I can't make anything. If I'm in a restaurant with a bunch of people, I know we had a pastor's function where all the pastors and their wives came together and when they all put us in this small room in this Italian restaurant with tile floors and, and the sound all bouncing off the walls and the idea was so we could get together and visit with each other, I couldn't hear anything except talk to the person on my right and my left. People across the table were going, <laughs> I'm going, Amen. <laughs> I had no idea what they said. Because when you get older, something happens to your hearing. I heard about this one grandpa. He had a sign above his lazy boy. It said, I'm not deaf. I'm ignoring you. <laughs> when you're young, your hearing is, you might not know it, but if you're, you're healthy and you're young, your hearing is very good. Matter of fact, they've discovered that your hearing diminishes when you're 25 so that they've developed an app. Young people have an app now. It's, they call it the Mosquito app. That when their phone rings, it makes a very high-pitched sound like a ee, you know, the mosquito, that real annoying thing, and you start swatting the air. And their teachers can't hear it. And so they're texting each other, and they're, the kids are all hearing ee, and they go, the teacher doesn't hear it. Because if they found a frequency. Now all the kids right now while I'm doing this are going online. They're looking for that app <laughs> so they can download that app and they can be texting during church and all the kids are going to be going wink, wink to each other. The adults are going to be clueless. But it is worthy of noting that it gets harder to hear as you get older. It's harder to hear God's voice if you wait too long. Young people, sometimes their voice, their, their hearts are tender and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Best time to reach uh, people is in their youth. We did this youth program a few weeks ago. Thank you for letting Pastor Ross and I go to Michigan. We thought that was very important because we are targeting kids like from 13 and under. And 50% of those who accept Christ did it in that age span. It seems like the voice of God doesn't penetrate as easily as we get older, we struggle to hear. And the other reason I thought it was important to talk about this is because uh, since we're not talking about hearing God's audible voice, we're talking about hearing Him speak to us in other ways, that is so easy to misunderstand. How do you know when God's speaking to you? Little girl heard her mom praying with a friend on the phone and she sat there awestruck for several moments and then when her mom paused she said, is that God? Can I talk to him? I thought she was talking to God because she's praying on the phone. So how do we know? First John 4, 1 John 4.1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now I looked at some of the different things and there are probably a dozen different uh, keys that we could look at about how do you know when you're hearing the voice of God or how do you identify the voice of God. But I'm going to give you four and uh, you may want to write some of these down. They won't be on the screen. Number one, is what I'm hearing in line with Scripture? Does the voice that you're hearing, the impression you're receiving, doesn't line up with Scripture? Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We measure what the voices are telling us by, is this matching up with what the Word of God says? Psalm 25 verse 5, lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the, all the day. We're listening for what the Word of the Lord says. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder 
and the sign of the wonder comes to pass. It does come to pass, of which he spoke. But then he says, let's go serve other gods. Oh, that's not a true prophet. So if you're hearing a voice and it's saying, you know, you don't really need to pay your taxes. But the scripture says, obey the laws of the land. Uh, you want to believe that's the voice of God <laughs> that says don't pay your taxes, but it's probably not. Because the Bible says that we ought to uh, do everything that is decent and we ought to live lives of integrity. Or if you think there's a voice that's saying, my spouse is evil and God wants me to find a new one. And uh, the Bible tells us that uh, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Uh, that may not be the Holy Spirit or God's voice that's talking to you. And if you think you're hearing a voice and it's saying, I could probably buy this and not tell my spouse. Well, that's not honest. That's probably not the Holy Spirit telling you that. The Bible says in Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimony, I mean the law and the prophets, the word of God, if it speaks not according to this word, it's because what? There's no light in them. So right away you can eliminate a lot of false voices out there by just saying, is what the voice is saying measuring with, with the word of God? But frankly, a lot of things that we need to know about, you're not going to find word for word in the Bible. So what are some other ways you could know if God is speaking to you? Second point, and this may be one of the most important. If you really want to hear the voice of God, the Bible says, he that has ears, let him hear. How many of you want to hear the voice of God? Are you like that guy in the branch trying to plug your ears and still listen? Yeah, you know, I want to come to church, but God, don't speak to me. Or are you like the Israelites saying, Moses, you talk to us, but don't let God talk to us. It's too much. But don't we want to be led of the Lord? Don't you want to hear Jesus speaking to you? All right. One of the most important criteria, if you want to hear the voice of the Lord, are you willing to do what the voice says? One of the central most important things, if you really want to hear God speak to you, is being willing to do what that voice says. John 7, 17, if anyone wills to do his will, he will know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. If you're willing to do his will. I heard about a uh, story. This man saw a lady walking down the road in England. She used to sell buttons. And whenever she, she came to a fork in the road, she'd take a stick and she'd throw it in the air. And the guy saw her throw the, air, the stick in the air two or three times. And, and uh, he said, ma'am, I can't help but wonder, what are you doing? She says, I'm trying to decide which road to take. He says, why are you throwing this? She says, well, I throw the stick in the air and... and uh, where it points, I go. And if it's not pointing down the road I want to go down, I just keep throwing it in the air. <laughs> See, I want to hear God's voice as long as it's telling me what I want to hear. But what about when he says something you don't want to hear? John 8, 43, why do you, Jesus is speaking, why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You remember we read a verse a moment ago when it says some people thought they heard thunder. Others said, no, it was a voice from heaven. And others, the apostles, heard what the voice said. That it was, this is my son. I have glorified your name and I will glorify. They understood what was said. Why did some understand and some not understand? I think it's because God had those understand who are willing to listen, who are willing to follow Jesus. You know, we're accountable for all that we know. God knows that. And if you don't have a heart that's willing to do God's will, He's not going to make you understand more than you need to know. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, not just because they don't know, and this is Hosea uh, 4, 6, but because you have rejected knowledge. And so we're accountable for what we know. And so some people don't know because they don't want to know. Some people don't understand Jesus that I speak in parables that those who want to know the truth, they will know. You know, God says, the Lord said, you'll search for me and you'll try, you'll search for me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. If you really want to know, you'll know. This man had some severe hearing problems. He went to the doctor and the doctor gave him, the hearing specialist gave him two very uh, modern expensive hearing aids. And uh, the man was so pleased. 
He came back a few weeks later. The doctor was going to see, do you need any adjustments? I can actually adjust these with computer. And it's very sensitive, very clear. He says, this doctor tests him. He says, you, evidently, now you've got 20-20 hearing in both your ears. I don't know what they call it for hearing, but it's perfect hearing in both your ears. The doctor said, your family must be very happy. The man says, I haven't told them yet. <laughs> he said, but it's been very interesting. And he said, I've changed my will three times. <laughs> they don't know I can hear them. So, do you want to hear what God is going to say? What if He's going to point out some sin in your life. Do you still want to hear? Another very important uh, criteria for understanding, something very important to understand God's will, is what the voice you're hearing, the guidance, is it supported by Christian counsel? In other words, it's not that God just speaks through His Word. Um, God speaks through other people. I'm hoping that's true, or what are we doing right now listening to me? If, like I said, if you're just listening to me, that's dangerous. Uh, we hope that God will speak through Christian counsel. Let me give you some verses on that. Proverbs 11:14, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. It's not just any counselor. You want good counselors. I'm always amazed in the Bible of the story of Rehoboam when he had to make a tough decision that was going to keep the kingdom together, he had the choice of getting Solomon's counselors or his friends. I mean, who would say no to Solomon's counselors? This is the wisest man who ever lived. If he picks a counselor, he's got to be like top tier, right? That's the A-team. And young Rehoboam, he said, nah, they're all fuddy duddies, you know, they're stuck in the mud, they're too conservative, I'm going to get my buddies to tell me what to do. And they gave him some advice and he lost half the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom was split from that time on until for 200 years after that because he listened to the wrong counselors. So when you're getting counselors, it's not any counselors, there's plenty of counselors out there. You want counselors with integrity, Christian counselors. God speaks through people. Ephesians 3.10 to the intent that now the manifold, manifold is like on your car, you've got an intake and an exhaust manifold, it's got many different ports. The multiplied wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Within the church, God has, some are prophets, some are evangelists, some are pastors, some are teachers, there are elders, there are leaders, there are people you can go to who have some age and experience and they will teach you. They'll give you advice. They'll counsel that through them might the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Acts 9.6, you remember when Paul had his vision on the road to Damascus. It says, trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, arise, go to the city, and it will be told what you must do. Well, Lord, aren't you going to tell me? No, I'm going to tell you through a person. His name is Ananias. God uses people to talk to people. Acts 10.4-6, and when he observed him, he was afraid. This is when Cornelius seized the angel. He said, what is it, Lord? He said, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa, to the house of Simon, whose name is Peter. He's lodging with Sa Simon a tanner, who is in the house by the sea. He will come and he will tell you what you must do. I want you to go get this man to tell you what to do. Uh, Spirit-led man. God speaks to people through people that are connected by, with God. That's why it's so important we're connected because other people may need our guidance. And then the final point is, not the final point of my sermon, final point of how do you determine, is what I'm hearing consistent with God's character. You know that old adage, WWJD, what does that mean? What would Jesus do? And there was a whole movement among evangelicals where all the young people were wearing these bracelets for a while that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? In every situation, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Would Jesus go here? Would Jesus read this? Would Jesus watch this? Would Jesus say that? Would Jesus buy this? And be asking yourself, if this voice is telling me to do something that's inconsistent with Christ, I think I'm hearing a voice that's telling me I can make a really good comeback to this person and put them in their place, and they hurt my feelings, and I've got a real clever comeback for them. Is that what Jesus would do? You know, you have to ask yourself, 
what would Christ do? Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind through the Holy Spirit, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to test things and say, what is the will of God? Based on what? 1 Peter, Peter 2, 21, for to this you were called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. This is so simple, friends, but a Christian is a follower of Christ. John puts it this way, 1 John 2, 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he walked. Are we walking with Christ? When you hear the voice, is a voice, a voice that is telling you to follow the example of Christ. Now, um, Jesus said that he's got sheep. If you're one of his sheep, you will hear his voice. John 10, 25, I'm sorry, John 10, verse 2 through verse 5. He that enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and notice the sheep hear his voice. He calls to his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will, no, by no, they will not follow a stranger, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Now, this is not as familiar to us today as it was to those that heard Jesus first speak these words. But back then, there's a lot of shepherds in um, Israel. They still have them today, but there used to be a lot of them back then. If you weren't a farmer, you were a shepherd. And um, there were a small number of watering holes. Sheep don't drink from rivers that are moving. They like still water. So I'd say, Psalm 23, you bring me to still water. So certain times of day were the right time of day for the sheep to drink, and then later they'd eat. And all these shepherds would come, and they'd visit with the other shepherds, and they would uh, chew the fat and talk and tell stories. Some of them may be true. And all their sheep would get commingled there at the watering hole, and the goats, and they're all drinking, and the shepherds are talking, and then finally it was time for them to then lead them to their various pastures. And the different shepherds would walk away from the watering hole, and they would give out this little call. They all had their little whatever it was. And they'd, they'd, call, they'd call their sheep, and they'd call them by name, or they'd call the bellwether sheep. That was like the lead goat or sheep. And they'd go, ah, they'd follow their shepherd. Another shepherd give a call, they'd follow that shepherd. And sheep all recognize their shepherd's voice. And Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And they follow me. Do you listen to the voice of Jesus? You know, sheep are not born knowing the shepherd's voice. They learn the shepherd's voice. And then they follow the shepherd's voice because that shepherd's going to lead them to the best pasture and the best water. It's going to protect them from the wolf and the bear and the lion. Jesus said, they hear my voice. Now, when we're asking about listening to the voice of God, um, this is a very important uh, subject because it's through listening to the voice of God we have opportunities to reach others. Have you ever had the voice of the Lord tell you to say something to somebody? And maybe you were afraid. I wish I could tell you I've always listened to the voice of God. You, know, you read stories like uh, Philip and the Ethiopian. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord said to Philip, arise and go down to Gaza. He doesn't know why. He said, that's where the Spirit's telling me to go. I'm not sure why. He figured there was someone or somewhere to preach. So he goes. And when he goes, he's standing on the road and this entourage is going by. It's, it's an official going down to Ethiopia having come from worship the temple. And there's this uh, chief treasurer for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. And he's riding along in his chariot and he's reading out loud from Isaiah chapter 61. He's reading the prophecy, or uh, I'm sorry, it's Isaiah chapter 53. He's reading prophecy about Christ. And Philip knows this is an opportunity. And the Holy Spirit says, draw near to the chariot. He hears the voice say, go to Gaza. Now he says, go to chariot. And he ends up saying, can you understand what you're reading? He said, oh, I need some help, actually. He says, well, you know, I specialize in that very chapter. Well, come up on in my chariot. 
tell me about it. He, the man ends up getting baptized. The Holy Spirit spoke to Philip, not because God's always talking to us, telling what kind of toothpaste should I buy and what kind of mouth. God's not, the main reason the Spirit speaks to us is so we can reach others. It says in Acts chapter 1, and I will give you my spirit and you will be my witnesses. The Spirit will speak to us and help us recognize opportunity to witness to others. And you know, sometimes I've heard that voice say, say something to them. And I was afraid. I m thought, well, it might be rude or others were there listening. I thought it might be ridiculed or I was busy and distracted with other things and I didn't do it. And I went away later and I felt so guilty. I've actually driven by hitchhikers before and as I drove by them, a voice said, you should have stopped and picked them up. I said, well, Lord, I'm in a hurry, and they kind of look a little dirty, and they say, can you car upholstery is kind of clean, and, and I'm arguing with this. A mile down the road, I can't shake the conviction I had to pick them up. Sometimes I've turned around, sometimes I haven't. Sometimes I stifle the conviction. I said, how do you know that's the Holy Spirit telling you that? Maybe you're just hypersensitive. Other times I was convicted, I turned around, went back, and I prayed with a person and led them to the Lord. And I think then about the times when I didn't turn around or I didn't say something to somebody. Now, I've never heard God speak audibly to me. I've heard my consci conscience like a trumpet in very loud tones bring conviction or guidance. I remember one story. This is close to the Philip story I can get. It was um, a Sunday morning and I woke up and I had this impression that I was supposed to go to the local Pentecostal church and preach. And uh, I thought, I'm not the preacher. <laughs> I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Why would I do that? And I couldn't shake it. And I'm fighting this impression and, and I'm walking around that morning. I'm thinking there's other things I want to do today. It's a beautiful morning. I've got work I'd like to do. And it was actually Easter Sunday. What pastor is going to want someone to walk in and take over their church and preach Sunday morning? And I just thought, I'm supposed to go to the local Pentecostal church. It was actually called Faith Tabernacle in this little town. And I couldn't shake the impression. And so uh, I thought, all right, I don't know, Lord, if this is of you, but I feel like I'm supposed to do it. And so I got dressed and I drove off to the church. I walked and I got there late because I'd wrestled with the Lord so long. They're already well into their worship service. They're at the part where they had prayer just before the sermon. But in this church when they pray, you walk in, they're all praying in tongues. And, um, and it kind of reaches a crescendo. And the piano's going while they're praying. And they're, they're, they're praying and they're kneeling and they're prophesying and they're doing their thing. And then eventually it starts to settle down and the piano slows down and that's the cue. And so I sat down. While they're praying, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm still supposed to preach today. Now, I've not even said hi to the pastor. I just walked in and found a seat in the back. And um, while they're praying, a sermon comes to my mind. No, it wasn't the mark of the beast. <laughs> and so finally they settle down and the music dies down and the people find their chairs and the ones who had been waving their arms, they sat back down and the ones who had been dancing in the aisles, they kind of went back and everything settled down. Pastor comes up, he's making some preliminary remarks and announcements and he sees me sitting back there and he goes, Brother Doug, I see our Pastor Doug is here. Welcome brother, we're glad that you're here. Did you have a word you'd like to say for the Lord? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, Pastor, you, you know us pastors, I said, I can't say just a word. He said, well, why don't you come up and preach? So I went up front and I preached. I'm giving you the short version of the story. And I made an altar call. And several people came forward, some of them speaking in tongues. And there was this one lady that came forward. And she knew that I was an Adventist pastor. And the next week she showed up at our church. She ended up getting baptized, becoming a member. And I always thought the whole reason that experience happened is because the Lord wanted to reach that one lady. And I think how often God is talking to us and there's people He wants to use us to reach, but we don't hear His voice or we're so distracted with the background noise. So that was one time I know I heard the voice of the Lord 
uh, telling me to do something because I mean, you know, what are the chances you're going to go visit a church and the preacher is going to say you preach so I know you can hear the voice of the Lord it's real you know why we don't sometimes hear his voice sin mutes the voice of God in our lives parents were real worried about their uh, they had like a 14 month old baby seemed to have lost his hearing they just didn't, couldn't respond, wasn't responding to anything they said anymore. And so they took him to the doctor. The doctor did a real basic examination. Soon he came out and he showed the parents two black-eyed peas. Evidently the kid during one of the meals had stuffed some black-eyed peas in his ears. And he couldn't hear. And I guess they weren't that uncomfortable because he didn't cry a lot. and He just was deaf. <laughs> Once you remove that, he could hear perfectly. Some of us can't hear God because we've plugged our ears. God will speak to those who have time to listen. Proverbs 28 verse 9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. We plug our ears, we don't want to hear from God. And he says, well, I'm, I'm not going to hear from you and I'm not going to talk to you. Now God will bring conviction. Uh, but God's not going to always answer our prayers. Psalm 66 verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. And then you read in John 9, 31. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, He hears him. That's pretty clear. 1 John 3, 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Are we willing to listen to his voice? You've got to be tuned in. You've got to say, Lord, speak like Samuel. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Heard about a uh, years ago when they had the telegraph office and uh, a man was applying for a job. He saw in the newspaper there was a job for someone to work in the telegraph office and, and he was able to listen and produce code very quickly. Uh, <laughs> I remember years ago you couldn't even get your ham license unless you could operate uh, Morse code. And, um, and I never could figure it out. I had a friend who was a ham operator and he was just so good at reading and producing code. Um, so this young man goes in the waiting room and he gets there late and the room is full of people waiting for this one position that's open. So he sits down and you know and the, they could hear the telegraph office was next door and people were receiving and sending telegrams. And soon this young man, he jumped up and he ran into the office. They were all waiting to be called into the office. He run, ran, jumped up without even asking. He barged into the office. Soon he came out smiling. They said, what are you doing? He said, I got the job. I said, how'd you get the job? He said, you guys weren't listening. All the time you were sitting here, the telegraph message was saying, this is a message going out to those in the waiting room. The first one who hears this and comes in gets the job. <laughs> they were waiting for the interview. They weren't paying attention. Are we listening? You know, uh, something else I've noticed about um, receiving the Holy Spirit, we hear God's voice when we accept God's plan. This is a very important point. We hear God's voice when we accept God's plan. God said to Abraham, Genesis 22, 18, in you and in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Notice, because you obey my voice. God did something through Abraham because Abraham listened. Have you read in Isaiah chapter 6? It says there in Isaiah 6, you read the first eight verses, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord on a throne high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And on the right and the left were these angels that were declaring, Holy, 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 Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of your glory. And the temple shook from the voice of God and the angels that were there and Isaiah fell down on his face and he says, Woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And because he confessed his sin, God then sends an angel who takes with tongs a coal from the altar and he places it on Isaiah's lips. And he said, Your sin is purged. Your sin is forgiven. Your iniquity is purged. So, after he sees the Lord, he hears the voice of God, his sin is purged, then he hears the voice of the Lord saying, 
Who will go for us? Who will I send? After his sin is purged, he hears the voice of the Lord. You notice after Jesus is baptized, he comes up out of the water. It says the heavens are open and there's a voice that says, this is my beloved son. It seems like we hear the voice of God a lot better after we accept the plan of salvation. John 10 verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. After you've committed to becoming one of his sheep, you're going to find you hear his voice a lot better. Problem is that uh, if you get further away from the shepherd, his voice gets weaker. You know, I drive around town, I listen to talk radio on 710. I listen to Christian talk, it's sermons most of the day. And uh, because we broadcast from that channel, I know where the towers are. And it's a very simple law of AM broadcasting. The further away you get from the antenna, the weaker the frequency. And as I'm driving around town, I can always tell when I'm getting closer to the antenna because the voice gets clear. The closer you get to the source of the voice, the voice gets clear. Something else that's interesting about radio, have you noticed that it's clear at night? You know some stations, they come in better at night? No, I'm up in Covalo FM in particular. I can barely hear family radio during the day. But once the sun goes down, the interference in the solar storms, you can hear it. You and I seem to hear a little better when it's dark too. What I mean by that is when you're going through a dark time, people become very sensitive to the voice of God when they're going through trials. Isn't that right? Uh, sometimes God has to send us through trials before we ever even hear His voice. So are you listening for that still small voice? It's not going to be thunder on the mountain. You may hear God's audible voice. Isaiah 30 said, you, your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or the left, he promises you will hear his word. 1 Kings 19.12, and after the earthquake and the fire and the, and the storm, then there was a still small voice. And it said, Elijah, what are you doing here? God often speaks in a still small voice. You just got to be listening. You know, uh, I, I remember reading about Helen Keller is kind of an interesting story from history that, uh, you know, she was born uh, blind. Well, she was, wasn't born blind. She actually got a disease and she became blind and, uh, uh, and deaf. I think she had scarlet fever or something that completely took away her hearing, took away her sight. Uh, she did eventually learn to talk. She had that famous teacher, Ann Sullivan. But uh, some friends, she was with a group of friends one time and they were listening to their radio back in 1925 and they said, oh, Helen, you know, they're talking to her through Braille or, uh, or tapping on her hands and, and they said, if you could only hear, this is so majestic. We're listening to Beethoven's Ninth. It's being placed by the, played by the best orchestra in the world in Carnegie Hall. They're broadcasting it on the radio. And she said, well, let me feel the speaker of the radio. So she put her hand on the speaker of the radio and she was amazed to discover, a matter of fact, I'll read it to you, it's in her words. Last night when the family was listening, she wrote a letter to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> Last night when the family was listening to your wonderful rendering of the Immortal Symphony, someone suggested that I put my hand on the receiver to see if I could get any of the vibrations. He unscrewed the cap and I lightly touched the sensitive diaphragm of the actual speaker itself. What was my amazement to discover that I could feel not only the vibrations but also the impassioned rhythm, the throb and the urge of the music. The intertwined, intermingling vibrations from the different instruments enchanted me. This is a person entirely deaf. Her fingers were so sensitive from reading Braille that she put her fingers on the speaker I could actually distinguish the coronets, the roll of the drums, the deep toned vo violas, the violins singing in exquisite unison. How the lovely speech of the violins flowed and plowed over the deepest tones of the other instruments. When the human voice leapt up thrilling from the surge of harmony, I recognized them instantly as voices. I felt the choir grow more exultant and more ecstatic, upcurving, swinging like a flame until my heart almost stood still. 
The women's voices seemed an embodiment of the angelic voices rushing in harmonious flood of beautiful and inspiring sound. The great chorus throbbed against my fingers with poignant pause and flow. The composer of the symphony Keller enjoyed was Beethoven. Now you realize Beethoven had written it a hundred years earlier while he was deaf. Perhaps one reason a deaf person could hear it is because a deaf person had written it. And perhaps the reason that we can hear the voice of the Lord is because God became one of us so He understands our speech so that we could hear His voice. Isaiah 51, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. Isaiah 54 verse 4, listen to me, my people, and give ear. Isaiah 51 verse 7, listen to me, you who know righteousness. Over and over God is appealing. He wants to speak to us. And he that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. Do you want to hear the voice of the Lord? If you submit to the gospel, if we will unmute the, the plugs in our ears so that we're willing to do His will and read His word, He will speak to us. We're going to sing about it. We don't sing the song very often. It's a beautiful melody. It's called, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. Only three verses. I want you to stand with me and listen to the words as we sing. 465. Hearing is a gift. They say if you live long enough, you'll lose it. Uh, hearing God's voice is a gift. If you wait too long to listen to His voice, uh, the speaker breaks and you just don't hear it anymore. So today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. Are there areas in your life maybe where you've been plugging your ears? You know God's will, but you're not wanting to do it. Uh, he only wants to bless you. Anything God is asking you to do, He's asking you to do it because He has your good in mind. And so I would appeal to you to listen to His voice, completely surrender to His will. 
Um, follow his plan for your life and then pray that you can hear that voice guiding you in opportunities to speak words of Christ to others. Amen? Is that your desire? Dear Father, I pray that you will give us ears to hear. Help us remove from our lives things that are muting that voice. Help us draw closer to the shepherd so that we can hear him broadcasting to each one of us. I pray, Lord, that you'll give us discernment through your word, through the example of Christ, so we can separate the counterfeit voices that are out there from your true voice. Lord, we know that the devil has a thousand distractions that make it difficult for us to hear. I pray that you'll guide us to better understand what those things are that are muffling your voice to our souls. Forgive our sins, Lord. Give us ears to hear and then hearts that are willing to listen and that we can also be witnesses for you as we seek your guidance in every affair of life. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd be seated for just a moment, one final announcement is uh, don't forget this afternoon, if you live in the area, we will be have Bible questions and answers here. We'll be broadcasting around the country to some of our AFCO students, but we'd love to have a live audience here. You might enjoy it. That's at 4 o'clock. We'll see you then. God bless.